Immanuel Kant and John George Hamann from the Life of Immanuel Kant by John Henry Wilbrandt Stukenberg, eighteen thirty five to nineteen hundred and three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Among the literary men in Konigsberg with whom Kant associated, John George Hamann was by far the most eminent. Our interest in him is the greater because we are indebted to him for many important hints respecting the philosopher and his labors. The rank assigned to him in literature is indicated by an article which appeared in 1853 in a journal published in Konigsberg, where both he and Kant were born and where they lived and died. It speaks of Hamann's fame as promising to surpass that of the critical philosopher, although during their lives Kant was famous and the magician of the North, as Hamann was called, was obscure and neglected. Verily, while Kant's activity almost lies closed behind us, the present judges, otherwise respecting the magician of the North, who is now honored as one of the greatest and deepest thinkers of the last century. But since this was written, the revival of interest in Kant has again exalted him, and has opened a new and important activity for his philosophy, and promises for it great things in the future and there can be no question that in intellectual greatness especially in speculation he was far superior to his literary friend hamann is however now receiving some of the merited recognition which his own age refused him and his words have a prophetic ring Quote, one easily overcomes the double grief of being misunderstood and therefore abused by his own age by cherishing confidence in the abilities of a better coming generation. Hamann was six years Kant's junior and died sixteen years earlier than the philosopher. Having completed his studies in his native city, he became a family tutor and afterwards went to London on business for a firm in Riga, but was wholly unsuccessful. Becoming dissipated, he spent money entrusted to him by the firm, and became indebted to them to the amount of three hundred pounds sterling. When on the verge of despair, he read the Bible and professed to have been converted. Quote, by means of a descent to the hell of a knowledge of self. End quote. He wrote an autobiographical sketch of his experience in London, giving a minute account of his career in that city, and presented it to one of his employers in Riga, at the same time asking for the hand of his sister in marriage. The man was shocked by the perusal of this confession, and as its author still continued the course of idleness into which he had fallen, his request was refused. The sketch created such aversion to him that the firm felt inclined to have him imprisoned for having wasted their money. After visiting Riga, Hamann went to Konigsberg, and Mr. Behrens, a member of the firm, also went to that city. This gentleman became intimate with Kant, and the two tried to rescue Hamann from the gloom which had settled upon him, and to induce him to work and form regular habits of industry not only was he melancholy and shiftless idle and restless but he also insisted on continuing in his idleness and on letting his mind brood or revel as it pleased their efforts to induce him to change his mode of life incensed him and to lead them to desist he wrote his socratic memorabilia in which kant and barons are represented as sustaining to him the relation of alcibiades to socrates in this little book he claims that he must go his own way guided by the word in his heart which is the light of the gospel hamann warmly defends himself and it is evident that on account of his religion he regards himself as superior to kant whom he does not think devout enough when this book appeared kant was thirty-five years old and had been a tutor in the university for four years Lindner, a mutual friend in Riga, interposed to restore harmony. The firm forgave the debt, and in spite of Hamann's passionate words in his book, he and Kant remained on friendly terms. In some respects, they were antipodes. 
the metaphysician was cold logical systematic and severely regular Hamann was passionate and imaginative a creature of moods and impulses kant made reason the rule of his life and the source of his philosophy Hamann found the source of both in his heart while kant dreaded enthusiasm in religion and suspected in it superstition and fanaticism Hamann reveled in enthusiasm and he believed in revelation miracles and worship differing also in these points from the philosopher in some respects they complemented each other but the repelling elements were too strong to make them fully sympathetic the difference in their standpoints however makes Hamann's views of kant all the more interesting in the course of time Hamann secured employment as a secretary in the government office but business was irksome to him and literature largely absorbed his attention following the bent of his own mind while at the university he had spent his time there chiefly in studying the humanities instead of preparing for the ministry as his father desired or of studying law though inscribed as a juridical student after settling down in konigsberg he devoted himself to theology philosophy ancient literature oriental languages and desultory reading he was a voracious reader the ancient classics the english authors being among his favorites his mind was receptive and creative and was easily aroused his imagination was vivid his heart passionate while not the man to treat a subject exhaustively or systematically he was original and had genius gifted with a keen prophetic insight and remarkable intuition his writings are peculiar rich in apothegms dark sayings and riddles his style is his own and the sententiousness the real profundity and the peculiar use of figures and symbols make his books obscure and there are passages which he himself did not understand some time after they were written but from the dark clouds lightning flashes give as it were revelations of nature the heart and divine things uniting in himself so much that is poetical romantic wild and weird he well deserved the regard of kant the high esteem in which goethe and other literary men held him and the name by which he is known in german literature the magician of the north Hamann, who frequently met Kant, had a profound admiration for his intellect and appreciated the excellence of his heart, but he was not blind to his faults and never became an advocate of his philosophy. Kant aided him in various ways and permitted his son to hear his lectures without compensation. Hamann recognized his indebtedness and was so anxious not to offend his benefactor that he hesitated to criticize his books as severely as he thought they deserved. He wrote to Herder, quote, Through kindness to my son, Kant has put me under obligation to him, so that I desire, as much as you, to avoid all unpleasantness. Aside from the old Adam in his books, he is really obliging, unselfish, and at heart a good and noble-minded man of talent and merit End quote. they frequently discussed literary subjects both were more eager to talk than to listen and as their differences were very marked their disputes at time became quite warm both however loved the truth and were sincere in their inquiries and each respected the views of the other soon after the troubles with the firm in riga kant and Hamann, who had both been family tutors, planned to write a book for children on physics. Hamann was no doubt better suited for such a task than Kant, being better able to enter into sympathy with children. For some reason the philosopher dropped the matter, and Hamann, with considerable passion and in an imperious tone, wrote to him to reprove him for abandoning the project he admits his learning and recognizes him as a philosopher but charges him with vanity and a lack of candor probably hinting that if kant aided in writing such a book as that contemplated he would accomplish something more useful than he had yet done he says quote, it is easy to preach to scholars as it is to cheat honest people nor is it a dangerous or responsible work 
because most of them are already so perverted that a venturesome author cannot any more confuse their mode of thinking even the blind heathen has regard for children and a baptized philosopher ought to know that in order to write for children more is required than the wit of fontanelli in a coquettish style one would injure children by that which petrifies beautiful spirits and inspires beautiful marble End quote. evidently regarding the philosopher as too far removed from the simple nature of children to adapt himself to their needs he warns him that he who would write for them must have a knowledge of children such as neither the gallant nor the academic world can give this was said when kant was as brilliant in society as in the lecture room Common severity is seen in the following quote, the spirit of our book must be moral but if we ourselves are not moral how can we impart a moral spirit to our books and communicate it to our readers we should obtrude ourselves as blind leaders of the blind obtrude ourselves i say without a calling and without necessity End quote. this is probably merely a hint that kant was not frank towards hamann in this matter kant did not reply to these insinuations and appeals and the project of writing the book of which the philosopher seemed to think little while hamann regarded it as very important was dropped their temperaments and standpoints made such conflicts unavoidable the impulsive unreserved magician could not put himself in the place of the self-possessed critical philosopher if hamann was one-sided was kant less so were not the qualities which had been excessively developed by the one the very thing which the other had neglected in later years hamann dealt less passionately with his eminent friend and frequently speaks of him with great praise he indeed thought that the remarkable fame of the thinker had made him somewhat vain but for this he blamed him less than the public once he exclaimed quote, how long was this great man obliged to be a tutor in the university how miserable was his condition as a student but with what modesty he afterwards enjoyed his great triumphs End quote. his conflicting views of kant must be ascribed largely to the changes in his own variable moods End of Immanuel kant and john george hamann from the life of immanuel kant by john henry wilbrandt stukenberg eighteen thirty five to nineteen hundred and three